Good afternoon. Thank you for joining OMHRC on today's webinar. We have our guest, Dr. Michael Liu, who is the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Student and Faculty Affairs at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University. Prior to joining GW, Dr. Liu is the Director of Maternal and Child in the Maternal and Child Health Bureau for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2012 to 2017. He led a federal bureau with an annual budget of more than $1.2 billion and served for more than 57 million women, children, and families nationwide. During his tenure, Dr. Liu transformed key federal programs in maternal and child health launched major initiatives to reduce maternal, infant, and child mortality in the U.S., and was awarded the prestigious Herbert H. Humphrey Award for Service to America. Dr. Liu received his bachelor's degrees in political science and human biology from Stanford University, his master's degrees in health and medical sciences and public health from UC Berkeley, and his medical degree from UC San Francisco, and his residency and training in obstetrics and gynecology from UC Irvine. We are so happy to have Dr. Liu here here. And with that said, Dr. Liu, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Tammy. Uh, can you all bring up my slides, please? Next slide. Now, some 242 years ago, a nation was founded on the self-evident truth that we're all created equal. 242 years later in that nation, that truth is still not quite so self-evident, right? You ain't created equal if you can't get an equal start. Next slide, please. Now, 50, uh, 54 years ago, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. told us about a dream that he had. He said that, I have a dream that one day, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls and walk together as sisters and brothers. Now, 55 years later in that nation, all too many little black boys and black girls die even before they learn how to walk with their white sisters and brothers. Now, I want to thank the Office of Minority Health and Dr. Henry uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all uh, this afternoon about a problem that has plagued this nation for a very long time, and a problem that continues to be one of the greatest challenges in public health in the 21st century. I'm talking about the problem of racial and ethnic disparities in birth outcomes. Next slide, please. As you know, an African-American baby born today is still more than twice as likely to die within the first year of life as a white baby. Next slide. So it's nearly twice as likely to be born low birth weight. Next slide, please. Nearly three times as likely to be born very low birth weight. Next slide. About 50% more likely to be born preterm. Next slide. And uh, more than twice as likely to be born very preterm. Next slide, please. And you know, even though this afternoon I'm going to talk, uh, focus mostly on black-white differences, I don't want you to think that this is just a black and white issue. Uh, there are great disparities across all different racial and ethnic groups, and even within one racial and ethnic group, there are great disparities. So for example, you see here that infant mortality amongst Puerto Rican Americans uh, is more than twice uh, that amongst uh, Mexican Americans. Next slide, please. There are all, also differences in, in the causes of infant deaths. So whereas you see here that birth defects are the leading cause of infant deaths amongst white Americans, causes related to preterm birth and low birth weight are the leading causes of infant deaths amongst African Americans. Next slide, please. And the question we want to try to explore this afternoon is why? Now, why do black babies have twice the chance of dying within the first year of life as a white baby and have all of these poor outcomes compared to uh, other babies? 
and let's examine some of the most popular uh, most popular explanations that's been advanced over the last several decades. Next slide, please. And certainly, uh, genetics is uh, one of those uh, explanations that uh, even today uh, there continue to be researchers uh, who continue to look for those genetic causes for racial difference in birth outcomes. But again, if this is all about genetics, then you would expect that women of, this, uh, of similar genetic backgrounds should have more similar birth outcomes, and we see that's in fact not true. Next slide, please. You see here that infant mortality amongst foreign-born black women is actually uh, about one-third lower amongst, uh, the, than that amongst U.S.-born black women. Next slide, please. In fact, uh, if you look at the, the birth weight distribution of babies born to uh, African-born uh, black women, uh, that's actually, that, that birth weight distribution actually more closely resembles that of U.S.-born white women uh, than U.S.-born black women. So this would argue against a purely genetic explanation, since otherwise you would expect that you know, women of similar genetic backgrounds should have fairly comparable birth outcomes, and we see that that's in fact not true. Next slide, please. Another popular explanation uh, for the, uh, the disparities in birth outcomes are uh, as kind of racial differences in maternal behaviors, uh, such as uh, poor nutrition, drug use, or smoking during pregnancy. And let's just kind of, uh, take smoking as an example. We know that smoking is certainly one of the leading preventable causes of poor outcomes on a population basis. Probably accounts for up to about 10% of preterm birth and up to about 25% of intrauterine growth restrictions. But if this is all about behavior, next slide please, then this is hard to explain uh, that uh, we know that, that actually more white women report smoking cigarettes during pregnancy than African-American women. Next slide, please. Or that African-American women who didn't smoke still have a much higher infant mortality rate than white women who did. Next slide, Next slide please. Another very popular explanation uh, is okay, racial differences uh, in access to annualization of prenatal care. We certainly know, next slide please, that women of color are less likely to access prenatal care early. Uh, they're also less likely to get adequate prenatal care. But again, if this is all about prenatal care, then this next slide is hard to explain. That despite very comparable levels of prenatal care, that infant mortality amongst uh, African-American women uh, is still more than twice that uh, than amongst uh, Latino women. Next slide, please. Or that African-American women with first trimester prenatal care still have a much higher infant mortality rate than white women with first trimester prenatal care. Next slide. Or white women who start prenatal care after the first trimester or had no prenatal care at all. Next slide, next slide, please. And, uh, uh, and this uh, uh, certainly another very popular explanation is about socioeconomic uh, differences. And in research, typically we measure socioeconomic uh, status either as household income or occupational status uh, or uh, parental educational involvement. But again, if this is all about socioeconomic status, this next slide is hard to explain. Here you see that uh, as a group, African-American women are actually better educated uh, than Latina women, and yet infant mortality is more than twice that amongst African-American women than it is amongst Latina women. Next slide, please. What that African-American women with more than 16 years of schooling still have a higher infant mortality rate than white women with less than 12 years of school. Now, I want you to pause here for a minute and just think about this. We're talking about African-American women who graduated from college, who gone on to grad schools, med school, law school, business schools, got their MDs, JDs, MBAs, 
we're talking about African-American women who are doctors, lawyers, and business executives, and they still have a higher infant mortality rate than non-Hispanic white women who were high school dropouts. And virtually all of the studies that's looked at is uh, 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 by controlling for socioeconomic characteristics that uh, continue to find this residual black-white difference in birth outcomes that's not explained by their uh, uh, socioeconomic status. Next slide, please. Now, I know as I, I was going through uh, uh, these, uh, these different risk factors, now some of you were probably thinking that in real life, it's not just one risk factor, but, but that many of these risk factors uh, occur simultaneously uh, to uh, influence birth outcomes. And so why not look at these multiple risk factors together? In fact, that study has been done, has been confirmed by several subsequent studies. Next slide, please. In this study, Shilna and colleagues uh, went out and talked to over a thousand pregnant women, and they asked you know, these pregnant women all sorts of questions about their demographic characteristics, medical risk, level of living, psychological risk factors, social risk factors, exposures, and they even came up with uh, uh, several of their own kind of newly defined indices like maternal adversity. And guess what? After they control for all of these different risk factors, they continue to find this residual black-white difference in, in birth weight that's not explained by all of these different risk factors. In fact, these 46 risk factors explain less than 10% of the variance in birth weight. Over 90% of the variance go unexplained. So if you think about well, okay, this, uh, maybe we're thinking about this problem all wrong. Okay? That, that, uh, that what we've been doing uh, with all these decades of research, that we've been taking a, a snapshot of a pregnant black woman and a snapshot of a pregnant white woman, and we've been trying to explain the differences in their birth outcomes based on these snapshots during pregnancy. Of course, we're not gonna explain very much, right? Because we might know how good their prenatal care is during pregnancy, but we might know, not know anything about their health care access across the life course. Or we might know how their nutrition is during pregnancy, but we might not know anything about their nutritional status entering pregnancy. So I think the way to really look at disparities in birth outcomes is not by comparing these snapshots during pregnancy. I think the way to really look at disparities uh, is by comparing their life course experiences and exposures, and that's the life course perspective that I was come, asked to come and talk to you all about today. Next slide, please. Now, the, the life course perspective, next slide, please, is simply just a, a way of looking at life, not as disconnected stages, but as an integrated continuum. It's a conceptual framework, some people might even call it a paradigm shift, that recognizes that each stage of life is influenced by all the life stages that preceded it, and it in turn influences all the life stages that, that follow it. Next slide, please. And I think this is really important uh, for, for us to think about uh, in, in uh, maternal child health, where one stage of life is often disconnected from the next. So for example, in, in, uh, in, uh, in perinatal health, we often focus on these nine months of pregnancy uh, and uh, without recognizing that there are a great deal of life course influences on perinatal outcomes and a great deal of perinatal influences on subsequent life course outcomes. For Decades in, in, in trying to explain this black-white difference in birth outcomes, we focus solely on uh, on these nine months of pregnancy rather than looking at the woman's cumulative life course experience of exposures. And I think the danger of looking solely at pregnancy uh, uh, risk factors is that not only do they not explain disparities very well, they could actually misguide public health programs and policies. Right? Because for decades now, we thought that if we could just get women access to good quality prenatal care, 
then we can really do something about closing this gap. Today, many of us are beginning to recognize that to expect prenatal care in less than nine months to reverse all the cumulative disadvantages and inequities that's accumulated over the life course of women and families is probably expecting too much prenatal care. And that if we really want to do something about closing the gap, we have to first start improving one's health, not only during pregnancy, but before pregnancy, between pregnancy, beyond pregnancy, and really across their entire life course. Next slide, please. Now, the life course perspective has two major components, an early programming component and a cumulative pathways component. I'll briefly describe each one of these components. I'll give you some examples of that and then talk about how this, the life course perspective uh, inform uh, our future direction for addressing disparities in birth outcomes. Next slide, please. So the early programming component posits experiences early in life, uh, including those inside your mother's womb, these early life experiences can influence your health and function for life. Next slide, please. And this is really the basis uh, for the Barker hypothesis uh, now, uh, which has, okay, over the last couple decades become known as uh, the developmental origins of health and disease. Next slide, please. What David Barker and his colleagues found through a remarkable series of studies is that they actually found this uh, relationship between being born low birth weight and increased risk for heart disease. Next slide. Hypertension. Next slide. And diabetes. 40, 50 years later on. Now, if I were to ask you, tell me some risk factors for heart disease, you'll probably tell me about obesity or smoking, hypertension, cholesterol. But how many of you would have told me about low birth weight? What does being born low birth weight have anything to do with your risk for heart disease later on in life? But what Barker and his colleagues hypothesized so that there are these sensitive or critical periods during development during which the function of an organ or system is being programmed. And if things don't go right, if something goes wrong with that programming, then that organ or system may never function optimally over the entire life course. A very simple-minded example is that if you were to get undernutrition in the second trimester, when the pancreas and the kidneys are rapidly growing, you end up with a smaller pancreas with fewer beta cells or smaller kidneys with fewer nephrons, and that may increase your susceptibility for diabetes or kidney diseases later on in the life course. Now, as you can imagine, the Barker hypothesis was met with a great deal of skepticism and even some ridicule when it was first introduced. But really, over the last couple of decades, there's been this growth of scientific evidence that's beginning to support this whole notion of early programming. And let me give you just a couple of examples from my own areas of research. Next slide, please. And let's start with maternal stress and fetal program. Okay. Let's say your mom was stressed out when she was pregnant with you. Well, what happened? Well, her body produces all of these stress hormones. Next slide, please. And in a couple different ways, which I won't go into today, these stress hormones can cross the placenta, uh, which in, in a way you're bathing the baby in all of these stress hormones. You're priming the fetal brain with all of these stress hormones. What, what do you think that does to the developing brain? Next slide, please. We now know from animal studies that there are two areas of the fetal brain that are particularly susceptible to the neurotoxic effect of the stress hormone cortisol, and that's the hippocampus and the amygdala. Now, the hippocampus is site for learning and memory formation, and rat pups exposed to a great deal of prenatal stress actually have a real tough time forming memories and learning new tasks. The amygdala it's a site that mediates anxiety and fear. And again, we see that rat pups exposed to a great deal of prenatal stress shows a lot of anxiety and fear 
during aversive situations. Next slide, please. Now, what's more important is that the hippocampus and the amygdala regulate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, which really mediates your fight or flight response. Now, I know this slide gets a little complicated, but, but just bear with me for a minute, okay? I want you to think of the hippocampus as a set of brakes pedal, okay? It breaks the action of the HPA axis. And I want you to think of the amygdala as an accelerator pedal. It accentuates the action of the HPA axis. Now, when, when mom is stressed out during pregnancy, the baby is exposed to a great deal of glucocorticoids, cortisol in humans, corticosterone in animals, which during critical periods of development could actually downregulate or decrease the number of receptors in the hippocampus. So in a sense, you're making this negative feedback less sensitive. At the same time, it's upregulating or increase the number of receptors in the amygdala, so you're making that positive feedback loop more sensitive. Okay, so think about this. You're making the hippocampus less sensitive, you're making the brake pedal less sensitive, okay, and you're making the, the accelerator pedal more sensitive. What are you gonna get? You're gonna end up with a baby with a more hyperactive HPA axis, a more overactive fight or flight response. If you think about, in a way, this actually makes a lot of sense, right? Because what mom is trying to do during those nine months of pregnancy is mom is trying to get the baby ready for the outside world. And if the outside world is stressful and hostile, what is mom gonna do? She's gonna try to get the baby ready for fight or flight by revving up this whole HPA axis, which in the short run could actually confer survival advantage for the baby, but in the long run could have serious health and development consequences. We now have at least 13 studies that's linked maternal stress and anxiety during pregnancy to increased risk for ADHD in childhood, suggesting that there may be something with the way these stress hormones influence the hard wiring of the fetal brain that may have long-term life, uh, health, and, uh, and developmental consequences. Next slide, please. I think what's most fascinating about this whole business of fetal programming is this phenomenon called epigenetics that most of you are familiar with. Okay. And basically what epigenetics is, it's, it's basically volume control for genes. Okay. You can turn up or down, you can turn on or off gene expression based on your environmental exposures, especially those exposures during critical periods of development. And there are a number of ways that this could happen, but one of the easiest way, most common way, is by simply by putting a chemical tag directly in front of that gene. And in this case, what you see is you know, one carbon, three hydrogen atom, that's a methyl group. You put that methyl group directly in front of that gene that blocks that gene from being ex uh, expressed. Alternatively, if I were to remove that methyl group, then that gene is allowed to freely express itself. So generally speaking, methylation blocks, silences, turns down, turns off gene expression, whereas demethylation turns on, turns up gene expression. So what we think may be going on with prenatal stress is to actually control the amount of glucocorticoids receptors that gets expressed inside the fetal brain simply by methylating or demethylating the DNA. I think that's fascinating because now you could have two individuals with the same identical genetic code and they can end up with very different levels of stress reactivity uh, for life based on what? Whether their DNAs are methylated or demethylated, which has to do with what? Whether mom was stressed out during pregnancy or not. Again, attesting to the important and potentially lifelong impact of mater maternal stress on child health and development. Next slide, please. And just to drive this whole point home about the importance of epigenetics, let me, let me just give you another example. If you look at this slide, 
closely, what you'll see is you see some blonde and chubby mice, and you see some brown and slim mice. What if I were to tell you that these mice are all genetically identical? In fact, all of these mice carry a gene called the agouti gene, which basically turns their fur coat blonde. The same gene also causes them to overeat, which then confer a higher risk for obesity, diabetes, and cancer later on in life. But despite being genetically identical, Researchers in the study were able to turn these mice from blonde and chubby to brown and slim simply by feeding their mothers a diet rich in folic acid during pregnancy. Now, what does folic acid have to do with this, right? Because you all know about folic acid and, uh, and neural tube defect, but what does folic acid have to do with your future risk for obesity? Well, it turns out that folic acid is a very rich methyl donor. It's got a lot of methyl groups. So moms who ate a diet rich in methyl uh, in folic acid basically methylated, turn off, silence, blocked those obesity gene before uh, her pup was ever born. Now imagine that someday being able to tell our patients that we know how to turn on those genes that's going to confer upon your baby good health and longevity and turn off those genes that's going to cause cancer, diabetes, and heart disease before your baby was ever born. This is no longer the stuff for science fiction anymore. In fact, I think the cancer doctors are about 10 years ahead of us, that, that they are already uh, working with the uh, a uh, uh, tumor, uh, uh, trying to figure out how to turn on those tumor suppressing genes and turn off those tumor uh, promoting genes. Okay. Although I do want to caution you against extrapolating too much from one animal study, because uh, certainly not all humans are rats, uh, but this is certainly one of the earliest and best examples of how DNA methylation uh, can can uh, influence uh, how how early nutrition can influence your DNA methylation, and that such epigenetic changes can have lifelong and perhaps even intergenerational in, impact on health and function. Next slide, please. The second example I'm going to talk about is prenatal programming of childhood obesity, and so you all know that there. Are it's this epidemic of childhood obesity that's going on in America right now, that over the last two, three decades, the rate of childhood obesity has basically doubled for white kids and tripled for black kids in this country. Next slide, please. Next slide. So a few years ago, my students and I were interested in this whole notion of prenatal programming or early programming of childhood overweight and obesity. So we did a systematic review of the literature looking for prenatal factors that's been linked to childhood obesity. And we found at least four. Number one, excessive weight gain during pregnancy. Number two, poor nutrition during pregnancy. And by poor nutrition, I don't mean undernutrition, right? Because you can have overnutrition and still have poor nutrition. Number three, diabetes during pregnancy. And that's both pre-gestational as well as gestational diabetes. And number four, smoking during pregnancy. In fact, if your mom smoked during pregnancy, you have about a two to three fold increased risk for being overweight or obese as a teenager, controlling for a whole bunch of different con confounding factors. Next slide, please. And scientists start beginning to map out the biological pathways mediated in these epidemiological associations. So for example, in the case of diabetes during pregnancy, let's say your mom had diabetes when she was pregnant with you. And let's say her diabetes was in, was in poor, poor control. And so you have all of these excess blood sugar that's crossing the placenta, which during critical periods of development actually caused the baby to produce a lot of insulin uh, in response to all that excess glucose. Uh, all that excess insulin during critical periods of development actually does three things. Number one, it lays down a lot of fat cells. Number two, it programs this uh, insulin resistance. And number three, it programs this 
uh, it programs uh, a leptin resistance. Now, you all know about insulin resistance, but what does leptin resistance do? What's leptin? Well, it's basically a satiety hormone, right? And, and so it tells you to stop eating when you're full. So if you get leptin resistance in your brain, you're going to keep on eating. Leptin also tells your pancreas to stop producing insulin. So if you get leptin resistance in the pancreas, you're going to keep on producing insulin, which is going to lay down more fat. So by the time, by the time that child is born, She's already born predisposed to a lifelong struggle with overweight and obesity because of all of these excess fat cells and program insulin resistance and leptin resistance. And then you add on top of that a fast food nation that supersizes everything. And that may be what's driving this whole epidemic of childhood obesity and early onset type 2 diabetes in our nation. So if we want to prevent childhood obesity in America, what do we have to do? it's probably not enough to just talk about school lunches and physical activities. Right? Not that those aren't important, but by the time the baby's born, you already lost half of the battle. So if we really want to prevent childhood obesity in America, we got to start much earlier than that by making sure that mom gains an appropriate amount of weight gain during pregnancy, that she has good nutrition during pregnancy, that her diabetes is in good control, and that she quits smoking, or better yet, that, that she never takes up smoking in the first place. Next slide, please. The second component of the life course perspective is the cumulative pathways model. And what the cumulative pathway model says is that chronic stress, okay, I'm talking about both psychological and biological stress, chronic stress uh, can, can cause wear and tear on your body's adaptive systems, which over time, can cause a decline in uh, a deterioration in your health and function. And how does that happen? Well, what happens to your body when you're under stress? Right? What happens when you see a saber to tie? Well, you run, right? And what helps your body run faster is that it activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the sympathoadrenal medullary system. Your body's putting out all of these stress hormones to help you run away from the tiger. What happens after you get away? Well, you relax, right? Your, your blood pressure comes down, your pulse comes down, and you relax. And that's the amazing thing about the human body is that it's self-regulating. It knows how to shut itself off once the stressor has been removed. Next slide, please. And that's what we call allostasis, which means to maintain stability through change. Now, allostasis uh, is, works very much by a, a, bio, uh, by, by a negative feedback mechanism that's common to many biological systems. It works very much like a, a thermostat. Okay? So let's say uh, if the temperature in the room falls below a preset point, what happens? Well, the thermostat kicks in the heat. Right? But as soon as that preset point is reached, what happens? Well, the heat uh, turns off the thermostat to prevent the room from being overheated. Well, it turns out the same thing actually goes on inside your body. That, that uh, when you're under stress, your body activates the HPA axis to produce cortisol. Cortisol in turn feeds back negatively onto the brain to shut off the HPA axis to keep, to keep your stress response in check. So that's allostasis of work, maintaining stability through change. Now, allostasis works well for stress you can either fight off or run away from. But what happens if there's nowhere to run? What, what happens if you can't get away? Well, in the face of chronic and repeated stress, your body loses ability for self-regulation. Next slide, please. So now you can turn it on, but you can't shut it off. 
Okay. Biologically speaking, what may be happening is you get this tonically elevated level of cortisol, which start to downregulate glucocorticoid receptors inside your brain, so you lose that negative feedback, and we find in humans and animals who are subjected to chronic and repeated stress, they actually walk around with higher circulating levels of stress hormone. And if you were to subject them to some natural experimental stressors, they would put out a lot more stress hormones to, than, than people naturally would. Next slide, please. And that's when you start to go on, to, to go from being stressed to being stressed out. Okay? And there's actually a big, big difference here, right? It's a difference between protection and damage. Okay? Because when you're under acute stress, your body activates a sympathetic response to increase your cardiac output, the, the amount of blood that's pumped out by your heart per minute. Okay? Again, to, to perhaps help you run away from the tiger. But when you're stressed out, you can't shut off that sympathetic response and that chronic uncontrolled sympathetic activation over time can lead to hypertension and cardiovascular diseases. Under acute stress, your body activates HPA axis to produce cortisol. And cortisol is a glucocorticoid and one of the main functions of glucocorticoid is actually converts your body's stored energy into glucose which become readily available fuel you know, to help you run away from tire. But when you're stressed out, and it does that actually partly by impeding insulin action. Okay? But when you're stressed out, you can't shut off the HPA axis, and all that excess glucocorticoid over time can lead to glucose intolerance and insulin resistance. As most of you know, under acute stress, your body's immune functions actually work better on, under chronic stress, you become a lot more susceptible to infections and inflammations. And I think the way to think about this, okay, is to, to think of the HP axis as a set of brakes on your immune system. So if you're chronically stressed out, that's like driving the car with your foot on the brakes. Right? So what happens to the car when you drive with your foot on the brakes? Well, the car just doesn't run very well. Uh, as in the case of depressed immune function and increased risk for infection uh, and infections. Uh, and that's why we have studies that show that women who are uh, chronically stressed are more susceptible to a number of infections that increase their risk for preterm birth. But if you keep driving with your foot on the brake, what's going to happen over time? You're going to wear out those brakes. Right? And now you have a much bigger problem. You can't stop the car, as in the case of kind of runaway inflammation. And think about all the chronic diseases in our society today that are characterized by excess runaway inflammation. Hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. And think about all the, uh, all the chronic health conditions that are characterized by a great deal of racial disparities lupus, nephritis, autoimmune diseases. And do you think that chronic stress may actually play a role in the pathogenesis of chronic diseases and in the origin of health disparities in our society today? Lastly, under acute stress, you actually get growth of neurons in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Now, these are learning centers inside your brain. It's almost like they're designed to help you learn from your mistakes. Uh, and that's why I bet most of you still remember very vividly exactly what you were doing when you heard about 9-11. But under chronic stress, the exact opposite happens. So rather than growth, you get atrophy and death of neurons in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Okay. And that's why we're, we get reports from women that, who are under chronic stress that they're beginning, they're, they're, they're becoming more forgetful that they're beginning to lose their memory. Next slide, please. Now, Bruce McEwen at Rochester University provides perhaps the best illustration of these concepts of allostasis and allostatic load in this cartoon here. Okay. Now, in this bottom image here, okay, this, this is a picture of allostasis, right? You got two kids balancing on the seesaw, maintaining stability through change. 
but what if I were to replace these two five kilogram kits with these two 500 kilogram sumo wrestlers? You put so much stress and strain on that seesaw, that sooner or later, that seesaw is going to break. And what if a woman were to enter pregnancy carrying these two 500 kilogram sumo wrestlers on her lap? She's not going to have a very good pregnancy. Next slide, please. I had served on uh, the uh, Institute of Medicine Committee on, on uh, uh, rethinking the uh, preterm birth uh, uh, years ago. Uh, and during committee uh, meetings, we had a lot of discussion about the need to really rethink the causes and prevention of preterm birth. And this is a big problem, right? Because as I mentioned, uh, the, the two-fold increase in preterm birth among African-American women accounts for about two-thirds of all excess black infant deaths in this country. So certainly if we could figure out how to prevent preterm birth, then we can really do something about closing the disgraceful gap in infant mortality in our nation. Next slide, please. Now during committee meetings, uh, we had a lot of discussion about the need to rethink the causes and prevention of preterm birth. And that's because we used to think that preterm birth was the consequence of some precipitating event, like a stressful life event uh, or an infection that occurred around the time of onset of labor. But we now think that the origin of preterm birth may actually occur much earlier than that, and that your vulnerability to preterm delivery may be traced to not only exposure to stress and infection during pregnancy, but perhaps more importantly, to your host response to stress and infection, and that's the stress reactivity and inflammatory dysregulation that's been patterned over the life course by these early programming and cumulative allostatic load mechanisms that I've been talking about. Okay. So if we want to prevent preterm birth in our nation, what do we have to do? It's a very simple message here, right? We've got to start taking care of women and families not only during pregnancy, but before pregnancy, between pregnancy, beyond pregnancy, and really across their entire life course. Next slide, please. And just in case you think I'm just talking about the babies, I'm not. Okay? Because the same, same uh, allostatic load, that same stress reactivity, inflammatory dysregulation that, that wreak havoc during pregnancy will continue to wreak havoc in mom's blood vessels and vital organs over her life course. Right? So we now uh, are beginning to get studies like this that show that women who had a preterm birth are significantly more likely to, to either get hospitalized or die from a heart attack within the next 15, 20 years compared to women who never had a preterm birth. And studies like this that's beginning to reframe the whole issue of preterm birth from simply a children's health issue to a women's health issue. That preterm birth may be a sign of things to come. It may herald the development of chronic diseases later on in the, in the woman's life course. Next slide, please. So what does all of this mean in terms of class and closing the black-white gap in birth outcomes? Next slide, next slide please. A few years ago, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from around the country and I decided to uh, kind of write this piece, uh, propose a 12-point plan on closing the black-white gap in birth outcomes. Now, we did it not because we had all the answers, but just to provoke some, some new thinking, a new national conversation about how we go about uh, addressing health disparities in our nation. And I'm not going to go over all of these 12 points. But, but the first four points around interconception, preconception care, about improving the quality of prenatal care, expanding healthcare access over life course, these four points move us beyond our current focus uh, on prenatal care to addressing the healthcare needs of women and families across their life course. The next four points around strengthening father involvement, uh, enhancing systems integration, creating reproductive social capital, and invest in community building. These four points move us beyond our current focus on trying to change individual behaviors to talking about strengthening family and community systems. And the last four points about closing education gap, reducing poverty, supporting working families, and enduring racism. These four points move us beyond our current focus on the biomedical model to start talking about how do we address the social and economic 
inequities and injustices that really underlie much of our health disparities. So let me just uh, uh, pick up this last point about undoing racism. Next slide, please. Which I really think is the elephant in the room. Now. Next slide, please. And we're you know, certainly beginning to get increasing amount of studies uh, that's linking exposure to racism to, to adverse birth outcomes. Uh, in this study, uh, Jimmy Collins and, and his colleagues uh, found that lifetime exposure to interracial, interpersonal racism in three or more domains of life uh, was associated with about a threefold increased risk for having a very low birth weight baby. And that's just interpersonal racism, right? What about institutional life racism? Next slide, please. Now, most of you are familiar with this, right? Dr. Kamar Jones talked about three different levels of racism, uh, internalized, interpersonal, and institutionalized racism. Now, internalized racism is when the racism is so pervasive that people of color come to see themselves as inferior. Interpersonal racism is the kind of racism that most of us think about when we hear about racism, right? It's, it's, it's the unconscious bias and conscious prejudice and discrimination, right? It's, it, it's, it's being followed around uh, when you're shopping at a nice store uh, or being stopped uh, when you're driving in a nice neighborhood, even though you're an African American doctor or lawyer or business executive. But there's another form of racism, per perhaps more pernicious and perhaps more pervasive than, than, uh, than these other forms of racism. And that's what we call institutionalized racism, which is defined as differential access to goods and services that a society has to offer based on the race. Differential access to goods and services that a society has to offer based on the color of your skin. And Dr. Jones provide, uh, provides, a, 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 I think, a powerful allegory to illustrate these different levels of racism. She said that in this garden, there are two flower pots. In the flower pot for pink flowers, the garden plant is, uh, in, the flower, in the flower pot with poor rocky soil, the, the, the gardener plant is seeds for pink flowers. And in the flower pot with rich and fertile soil, the gardener planted seeds for red flowers. Now, over time, the, the red flowers obviously grew better than the pink flowers, uh, and, uh, and, and over time, the, the flowers passed seeds into the same soil, so generation after generation, the, the red flowers flourished while the pink flowers languished, struggled to survive. So how do you get things right in that garden? Well, Dr. Jones said that it's probably not enough to just sit down with the pink flowers and tell them that pink is beautiful. And that it's probably not enough to sit down with the gardener uh, and tell them that you really should try to treat the pink flowers a little better, right? try to do some cultural sensitivity, cultural competency training. Not that those aren't important, but how do you get things really right in that garden? Well, there are two ways, right? You either mix the soil okay, or you enrich the soil in each flower pot, in the pink flower pot, until it is as rich and fertile as the soil in the red flower pot. And that's what we, we're really talking about here today. We're talking about the uh, enriching the soil with good health care and good education and good jobs and good opportunities, creating those social conditions in which all women, children, and families can thrive. Now, let me just uh, close with this one final thought about infant mortality, especially about the disparities uh, in, in infant mortality. If you think about this, I think ultimately infant mortality is really more than just an accounting of, uh, of infant deaths. And it's really more than an indicator of population health or even social inequality. If you really think about this, 
this, the disparity in infant mortality is really a measure of how much we fail the greatness of this country. Now, it's a greatness that was some, in, the, in a simple proposition some 242 years ago that we're all created equal. And it's a greatness that was made by a simple promise that, that everyone gets a fair shot no matter where you're from or the family you're born into or the color of your skin. And it's a greatness that is, that, that is told in simple dreams many times over when we tuck our children in the night when we tell them that when you grow up, you get to be anything you want to be. And it's a greatness that I just didn't just learn in the classroom or read in the textbook. I saw it and lived it, perhaps like many of you. Those of you who know my story know that I was born to two immigrant parents without a college education. In fact, my mom, she actually never went to high school or even middle school. See, my mom was only 11 when her father died. So as the oldest daughter, oldest girl in the family, she had to drop out of fifth grade to go work in the fa uh, factory to help support the family. Now, when I was born, uh, they were still pretty poor. Uh, I was actually born into a tiny little apartment on the other side of tract in Taipei where family six was cramming to. No flush toilet, no running water, health insurance. We didn't have health insurance because there weren't such things as health insurance. And so whenever you get sick, and unfortunately I was sick a lot as a child, that you never knew how much the, the doctor or the medicine was going to cost. And from time to time, my parents had to make that choice between paying for food and paying for medicine. At one point, my mom actually sold her wedding ring to pay for my medicine. So I certainly didn't come from an educated family or a wealthy family. But none of that mattered anymore once we came to this country. And it didn't matter because I knew that in a great America, you don't have to be rich to, to get a good education. And it didn't matter because that I knew that in the great America, everyone gets a fair shot no matter where you're from or the family you're born into or the color of your skin. And it didn't matter because I knew that in a great America, if I just work hard enough and try hard enough, I can give my children a better chance. The kind of chance that my mom wouldn't even ever dare dream. Next slide, please. And that my two daughters, the granddaughter of a girl who had to drop out of fifth grade, can now grow up in a nation where they get to be anything they want to be. That's what truly makes America great. But if my girls can get that chance, why shouldn't every child in America get the same chance? If my girls can get a fair shot, why shouldn't every child get a fair shot? So this is what this fight is all about, right? This is not just a fight to close the gap in infant mortality. This is a fight to close the gap between what we are as a nation, as a people, perhaps what we've always been, and what we can be and must be. And even though I've left the bureau now, I want you to know that, that I'm, in, I'm, I'm still in this fight, and I ask you to join. If you still believe in America's greatness, if you still believe in the American dream, Please join me in this fight, and together, let's close these gaps. Together, let's make sure that every child, every family, no matter where they're from, the family they're born into or the color of their skin, have a fair chance at, at, at reaching their fullest potential. Now, now, we might never get there ourselves, but if we keep working at it, someday we will get there that our children and our grandchildren will get there. 
And ultimately, that's what the life course perspective is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. We have time for about two questions. May I have them? All right. Let's see. All right. Question. Uh, Dr. Liu, I truly appreciate you doing this webinar. I'm an African-American pediatrician and researcher. Seven years ago in medical school, I had a 25-weeker. My story was featured in a newspaper series titled Empty Cradles, highlighting the infant mortality crisis in Wisconsin. You were interviewed and quoted for the story. Now, seven years later, I've just accepted an assistant professor position to work clinically part-time. Um, 50% of my time is for scholarly work. Uh, okay, this person wants to know how can upcoming researchers passionate about advancing knowledge in this field connect with you? Do you have any ongoing research? Um, is there any way that they could work with you in the near future? <laughs> uh, absolutely. absolutely. So, so uh, uh, let me give you uh, my email. Uh, let me give you all my emails. Uh, Amazon Michaels, uh, C L U at G W U uh, dot E D U. Uh, please just go ahead and send me an email, and we can explore uh, okay, what uh, okay, what you're interested in. Uh, I do have to say that there's still so much uh, for us to learn. Uh, that there's still so much uh, for us to do, uh, and so. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and uh, whatever I can do uh, to help advance our common mission, common cause here. I see that as my job now. Thanks, Dr. Liu. Another question asked, uh, are socioeconomic or is socioeconomic standing a driver for black women's infant mortality? Uh, certainly, it, it's important. Uh, so, uh, for example, we do know that that uh, socioeconomic status does offer some protection of, uh, against infant mortality, uh, but not much uh, for, for African-American women, certainly not as much for African-American women as it is uh, kind of for, for white women. Uh, so the question uh, that we try to address today is why, uh, and okay, based on what I just talked about, that you have to think about the, the social condition, the social environment, and the life course experiences that, that even college-educated uh, uh, okay, African-American women uh, have, uh, uh, you know, have, have experienced uh, that, that may uh, okay, increase their risk uh, for, uh, for adverse birth outcomes despite uh, their socioeconomic advantage. Thank you. Um, we have another question that reads, are we looking at epigenetics and disparity in generations as a driver for better outcomes regarding the health of black women? Yeah, so, so there are now some research that's beginning to look at the role that epigenetics play uh, in terms of the intergenerational transmission of birth outcomes. But again, I think this is a, a kind of really important uh, area of the research that's still in its kind of very early gestation. And, and so I would you know, certainly uh, kind of invite uh, kind of young investigators, you know, kind of young researchers, to, to really think about, okay, how do we build on this and how do we make sure that you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, that we have a much better understanding of both the causes and prevention of the disparities in birth outcomes. Thank you. Another question asks, on the slide representing infant mortality among U.S.-born black women versus foreign-born black women, are the foreign-born women living inside or outside of the U.S.? Good question. Yeah. So, so these are foreign-born women living okay, in the United States, uh, and, and we actually see that through through uh, okay, a number of different uh, studies. Uh, so, uh, so, so uh, that generally we find that foreign-born women uh, living in the U.S. do better uh, in terms of their reproductive outcomes compared to U.S. born women. But what's interesting uh, is that, that the, the longer the foreign born women uh, stay in the United States, the more acculturated they become, uh, they start to lose a lot of the birth advantages that they traditionally enjoyed. And so that there's a study in California that showed that 
for Hispanic or Latina women uh, that simply by okay, being in the United States uh, for more than five years, okay, erase most of those kind of birth advantages that that uh, that that we traditionally see. So so you really have to think about what is about kind of living in the United States. What's the experience in the the, the social environment, the cultural environment that's different uh, in the U.S. Uh, that may uh, that 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 you know, that may uh, uh, impact and, and influence the, influence their birth outcomes. So again, I think that's another important area of research uh, that that gets into like questions about the uh, chronic stress uh, resilience, both at the individual, family, community, and cultural levels, uh, and what may be lost through the acculturation process. All right, it is 1 p.m. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu, for providing us with a wealth of information. We are so appreciative, and uh, we will forward you the remaining questions that perhaps you can answer when your schedule permits today or this weekend. Thank you again for providing us with this information, and I hope to talk to you soon. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Henry, for this opportunity. You're welcome. Have a good day, everybody.